my story is a bit of a rich dad, poor dad story. I grew up in a very affluent suburb here in Sydney. It's called Hunters Hill. It's full of millionaires, the odd billionaire. And uh, I grew up the son of a market man and grew up in a neighborhood probably we didn't belong in. Uh, my dad uh, openly sort of explained that he grabbed the real estate he bought in a week period of the market. I think there's a real lesson in this that quite often there are market highs and market lows and he jumped into this suburb when you couldn't give away a property he bought in a suburb which he didn't necessarily belong in and uh, by virtue of the cycle at the point of the market when there was the weakest point was able to just barely afford the worst house in this particular neighborhood you're listening to property investor tales stories from the front yard here's your host james evenden g'day everybody and welcome to property investor tales stories from the front yard where i get to speak with property investors from around australia about their investing journey my name is james evenden and i am a property consultant with positive real estate uh, we're here to help people build wealth through property this episode I'm very excited to bring you. I, if I had a drum, I'd be rolling it hard now. We have got the man himself, Sam Saggers. Sam is online with us. Give him a wave, Sam. Uh, we have been in business at Pre. It's over 8,000 clients across Australia and New Zealand. Some incredible stories. I'm so grateful to have Sam on today. He's been an inspiration, a guide, and a mentor for me, possibly you too, for many, many, many years. Um, Sam is going to uh, share some stories. We're going to get some gold out of him, some nuggets, maybe some uh, some good, not so good stories. Um, I'm excited for that. So uh, please welcome me with Sam and uh, let's kick it off. Hi, James. How are you, mate? Uh, pleasure to be here. Can't wait to uh, talk tales. There's always a few tales inside of real estate, isn't there? There's always a few golden nuggets people can learn from. And of course, uh, I'm a great believer we all make mistakes in this world and it's how we come out the other side. And of course, I don't think there's too many people who are natural born property investors. We all learn a few tips along the way and hopefully I can share a little bit of wisdom for your listeners today. But, Thank you. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, we do. And I think it's through sharing, whether it's our stories or lessons, we'll call them lessons. You know, it's a modern era. We call them stories. By sharing our stories, we get to learn. Um, maybe let's just dive straight in with that, mate. Your earliest lessons or stories around property and investing, what did you see early on that maybe turned your gaze to property and investing? Yeah, yeah, mate. Um, my story is a bit of a rich dad, poor dad story. I grew up in a very affluent suburb here in Sydney. It's called Hunters Hill. It's full of millionaires, the odd billionaire. And uh, I grew up the son of a market man and grew up in a neighborhood probably we didn't belong in. Uh, my dad uh, openly sort of explained that he grabbed the real estate he bought in a week period of the market. And I think there's a real lesson in this that quite often there are market highs and market lows and he jumped into this suburb when you couldn't give away a property he bought in a suburb which he didn't necessarily belong in and uh, by virtue of the cycle at the point of the market when there was the weakest point was able to just barely afford the worst house in this particular neighborhood and when I say the worst house it was falling apart and so me my brother my sister my mum my dad uh the dog the cat the budgie we all cramped into this sort of 1930s archaic home in this very very wealthy suburb what i learned um in those early years was just how amazing property is i got to not only go to some of the best properties in australia some of the uh you know dream properties that you would say um, that are out there in Australian real estate. I got to visit them because obviously I was friends with um, a few people in the neighborhood. 
But I also got to learn that rich people do get wealthier from real estate investment. And so I was exposed to real estate really, really early on in my life. I can always remember that I knew I was going to become a property investor. I just didn't know when it would happen. But it was always in my mind as a teenager that when I finished school, I got into real estate and get involved eventually as a property investor in real estate. Obviously, I had to go away, learn how to save a deposit, start a budget, the simple stuff to get my first property as an investment. And going back to your question, I guess my first real lessons around real estate investment really did come from my first ever property I bought. And I think, you know, we all pay for lessons in one way, shape or form, whether you, uh, you know, are a little bit perhaps high achieving and go and do a course and pay for it that way, or you rather like me probably run with the back of the pack, be enthusiastic about stuff then go out and do it in the real world and make a mistake. And for me, um, my first property deal, James, was was what I would call a mistake. Um, But it it certainly sent me in a different direction where I am today, where I've learned a lot about real estate. Um, So, mate, probably to be specific, the mistake I made was to not understand the concept of diminishing marginal costs. Yes, it's an interesting conversation. So the first property I bought, it was in my local community. Um, It was, I felt safe buying it and I was really, really enthusiastic. It was kind of like, I don't know, James, have you ever bought a new car and you kind of feel like, you kind of feel like, it's the only car in the world, right? Like you you don't see the other cars that are the same. And I rode you, higher. Yeah, you get these blinkers, right? And um, I think anyone who's ever bought a new car probably gets the blinkers. Oh, wow, there's no, no one else drives the, you know, the Audi Q3. And then when you buy the Audi Q3, you drive down the road and you all you can see is Audi Q3s everywhere. And so my first property, I had blinkers on. I was full of energy, full of um, gusto. I dreamt my whole uh, early adult life, my teenage life to get my hands on this property. And so I bought a property um, in a place called Putney, which is in Sydney. And uh, it was what I could afford at the time. Uh, From memory, I think it was like $240,000 or something like that. Um, and you know, I had my blinkers on when I bought it. I was just, it was more about getting it than understanding what it could actually do, where it could take me later in life. I had no comprehension that actually I'm buying something that I'm meant to live off when I'm 65 years of age. And so my first, uh, look at that property when I settled it. I took friends and family and I was like, look what I've just bought. And the first thing they did, of course, without blinkers on is go, well, do you realize the driveway needs to be redone? Like it's completely cracked. There's tree roots pushing up the driveway. The gutters need to be redone. Um, There's a crack, a hairline crack in the back of the, the building. All of a sudden, I'm going, wow, what have I done here? I've, I've, I've put a lot of energy into this thing called real estate. I love this thing called real estate, but I've actually not understood the mathematics of real estate, the numbers of real estate. And in real estate, we call that almost like diminishing marginal return theory. So for me, I had to look at that real estate and go, oh, hang on a minute. Okay, you can rent for 250 bucks a week, which is a 5% return. That's great. But for that real estate to see its better best days, I had to go and spend $100,000 to fix it. 
Now, if you're going to spend $100,000 to fix something of real cash, uh, you need a huge cash on cash return to get your money back. And of course, this real estate couldn't do that. So what it would do is ultimately diminish the result of the return. In other words, I would have to overcapitalize to make the property better than what it what it was to make it um you know almost like in a fair repaired state and of course uh there's no way you could get that back on a rental return you couldn't spend a hundred thousand dollars on the property even if you got an extra 25 dollars a week it would take you three lifetimes to recoup the hundred thousand dollars so um yeah, my first lesson was that numbers matter inside of real estate. And of course, this is where today I'm very, very diligent around that actually the dwelling of real estate can diminish in value and to prop up that dwelling to make it restore it to, to its optimum level uh, can quite often mean for some properties, it's just not worth the spend. And so for my first investment, I soon realized, well, hang on a minute, I've got to use this thing in retirement, like 65, this is why I'm buying it. And do I really want to hold something full of problems, full of costs, and will I even get a return in retirement? So it's quite an interesting thing is, and I don't know if I'm talking too much, by the way, James, just tell me to shut up because um, I tend to wrap it on. But, mate, when I, think, when I think about it, it's like what question should you ask yourself as a property investor? Like who are you as a property investor? And really it dawned on me back then that to answer that question, who am I as a property investor? I am actually my 65-year-old self. I'm not my 25-year-old self. Does that kind of make sense? I'm the person in retirement that I need to be. And so the real estate needs to match who I am in my retirement. It needs to be simple to run. It needs to be uh, high returning. It needs to provide a dividend because I'm going to live off it from a cash flow perspective. Uh, when I buy real estate, I'm not buying it as Sam Saggers today, 47 years old. I'm buying it as Sam Saggers, who will be 65 years old, because that's when I need to use it. That's when I don't have the job. I can't rely on other ways to live. And so my first investment was a train wreck because I bought it as... 25 year old Sam or around that age I can't remember specifically now but um, I was I wasn't thinking about who I would become oh. and so yeah completely blew, blew my blew my mind to think of it that way and once I started to think well I gotta buy this stuff for the old version of me not the young version of me changed the way I looked at real estate oh um, that's a it's an awesome story and so many layers in there. And geez, I've got a script of questions here, Sam. I'm chucking it out the door, mate. Mate, get, get rid of it. Talk and talk <laughs> I've jotted a few notes. There's a few things I'd love to come back to and just weave through. So you mentioned there towards the end, um, your identity. Can I just, your identity as an investor, because I heard the story of early Sam in Hunter's Hill and seeing the homes and learning the stuff. Did you learn that desire to become an investor? Was that implanted you as a teen through something you th saw through your friends and their parents doing or just from your dad? Can I also ask, you know, because we all come from families and we may be single child, but families, your brother and sister, I know that I'm different to my siblings and my I've gone on to do that. So I'm, I'm just, we're all different. We can grow up in the same household and get that identity that we're always going to have. Just, I'd love to hear a bit yeah, more. Yeah, sure, mate. Identity. Yeah, no, great question. Um, look, I'm the youngest. I'm the, uh, the one who probably was able to live in the suburb the longest as, as a child. 
Um, I'm virtually 10 years younger than my brother, for example. But what I learned in that suburb was uh, a lot about how rich people think about the different way they approach life, uh, that they quite often have assets behind their uh, fortune. And like I did live in this kind of rich dad, poor dad kind of experiment, um, a live experiment. My dad, albeit unlike the book by Kiyosaki as the poor dad, he also had a rich dad mindset. He was a hustler. He um, loved real estate. He encouraged me to learn as much as I could about real estate. He understood that you can't get wealthy from your wage. Um, he taught me about uh, being a market man and working down at a famous market here in Sydney called Paddy's Markets. He would take me down there and teach me you know, the idea that money is to be made within the marketplace. He would give me lessons around really the idea of uh, how things are bought, how things are sold. But then I also had a rich dad and my uh, good friend, Sean, his father today is, is a billionaire here in Australia. Um, they were actually famous for starting a supermarket chain here in Australia called Franklin's. Um, many people might remember that supermarket chain. What was famous about Franklin's was also a brand that they invented, which was called No Frills. No Frills was like the first iteration of uh, basically you could buy butter, but it had it, it was kind of like the supermarket's butter or you could buy bread and was the supermarket's bread. So they made a lot of money and they had some of the best and still have today uh, Australian property investment. So I would spend time with uh, Gary and Sean. Gary was Sean's father or is Sean's father. Um, and, you know, it was quite, uh, I guess, learning by osmosis in a way. I would travel around with them just because we would be going to sport or we'd be going to soccer practice. And then Sean's dad would be like, oh, Sean, we own that building. We own that building. And I'm talking some incredible real estate um, here in here in Australia, um, places in Pitt Street Moor and Manly Corso and Oxford Street Paddington. And, um, you know, Sean's dad was trying to cheat Sean, but inadvertently... <laughs> Uh, I learned a lot as well. And Sean um, very much knew he was, um, you know, fortunate to have a, a father who was very property focused. And, you know, in our uh, early adolescent years, that's what we would talk about, sit on the couch and talk about, you know, real estate and and what it means. And, and I think in some ways they always took a shining to me because I had further to go than they did, but they had so many lessons because they were so wealthy that they could sort of no teach doubt. me. They saw that you were eager and open and, you know, that's right. Curious yeah. And just, you fit it in and you did all those things. You were you, they loved you. And they're like, yeah, this kid's got, he's got the air, you know, he's got what it's, it's going to take. So I love that. So that identity was developed early and nurtured by your father. I love hearing that. Um, and also, you know, within your immediate circle there and, and from, you know, pretty powerful teacher and self-made billionaire who created effectively, you know, white label products and, and you know, that are now yeah. such yeah. a part of the, you know, consumerism that many of us, any, so, so that identity was struck early. I love it. Um, Another thing you mentioned through your story of Putney, I love it, where Putney, let's go back to Putney, and you your lesson through there was that you learned about the numbers and you had to learn that and you learned that through osmosis and just and, and you had to go through it and realise it. How long did it take and was there, shit, I got to open the books or did someone point it out that the numbers became something you understood? Did you actively look for that or was that... Yeah, uh, great question. So, so I bought I bought the property, and you know, I soon realised, um, you know, first month the mortgage comes in, you go, "Yep, great." Um, I put some tenants in, um, and 
you know, then the bills started to add up. Then um, all of a sudden, it was actually in a community title strata scheme, the building or the the, the apartment. Um, and, you know, then they, they would start to put together special levies and things to, you know, look after this old, uh, is an old sort of red brick 1960s walk up. Um, you know, when you walked into it, you today, you know, under modern occupation, health and safety conditions, you would have to say the property could not possibly be what it was back then. It's either been bulldozed, I should drive past it, it's either been knocked down or it's had to go through an extensive rehab, not renovation, rehab to fit into current uh, laws and conditions of the day. So it was it was pretty run down um, and, you know, pretty well straight away I started to work out that there is no return from this investment. And so think about investing, right? Like you've got three things you can do. You can uh, put money in the bank and save. It's not really, no one's ever saved themselves wealthy, like it doesn't exist. You can invest. There's only two investments on planet Earth that are dividend paying and capital growth paying. That's the stock market and the real estate market. Then you've got speculation investments, things like crypto, gold. You're speculating um, basically that someone's going to pay more for the uh, for the asset into the future than you are. So if you remove the return from property, it actually is a speculation investment. In other words, really, you might as well go buy crypto, you might as well go buy gold, because if you've got no return from the rent, and the rent doesn't cover the cost to run the asset, or the rent is being diminished because the asset is such a poor asset to hold, then you've only got a speculation asset, which is the hope of capital growth. And so what I learned was back then that I had a diminishing returning uh, property. It was going backwards, not forwards in the, um, in the rent side of things. And because of that, it wasn't actually an investment anymore. It was just a hope and pray speculation asset and I could do better than that and so after about 12 18 months it must have been and it is a long time ago now so I don't know the exact you know date uh, uh, date range or or time frame it could have been 14 months 16 months but it's around that anyway I I put the money put the property on the market and um I sold it and I didn't make any money. Um, I made a small loss actually. But the lesson taught me about the numbers. It taught me about, hang on a minute, real estate is an investment. Investments need to have a dividend and also the ability to appreciate, not just to appreciate without a dividend. And obviously in, in property language, a dividend is rent. Um, so I went down the path of seeking out other alternative investments at the time. And um, really what I had to redo back then was learn to save again. I was a really good saver as a young person. I was never caught up in um, a young flash lifestyle. Um, I drove an Austin 1800 uh, if you've ever seen an Austin 1800, it's probably the world's worst motor car. Uh, it had drum brakes. You had to pump the brakes to try and stop the car. Half the time I was doing hand brakeies. It was a death trap. I was in a death trap for about a decade to just not spend money. I mean, my car cost $900. Um, so the first 10 years of my ec economic life, I was in a $900 car um, because... You know, there's an old saying, you know, um, you know, work hard in the early stage of your life, have a have a nice, easy later part of your life. Um, and, you know, 
that, that, that that's With fundamental. Kiyosaki 101 too, isn't it? No doodads. I think he calls doodads doodads. Yeah. Um, you know, you put your money into uh, income generating assets. And I'd well, still that's... disagree with him on the house, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, I think we all do. Um, but you're right, you're right, mate. It's it's about it's 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 not about also what you earn; it's what you keep, particularly yes. in those foundation years. And um, you know, I was able to resave money quite quickly because I lived a very uh, simple simple life, I guess you um, would say. In Austin, in and, the Austin, uh, in the death trap. So it so, wasn't, so, it wasn't so, great for the, uh, for the uh, social life with the ladies, but um, hey. Uh, right. Sydney's got the right. beaches. You don't take your car <laughs> on the beach on your towel, do you? <laughs> well, I don't think too many girls wanted to get in the Austin 1800, just That's a few right. <laughs> buff-head yes. mates. But uh, no, nah, that, was, that was the early years, mate. It was all, all about learning stuff. And, um, and wouldn't and, it be just... Nuts. I mean, if you look back now, cast your mind back to those days and you just how what you know now and what you didn't know then was staggering, right? That so so it's funny because I've got the whiteboard over me and uh and on one of our banners it says an investment in education is the greatest you'll ever make. Now you can choose to learn that through le- just life or you can open the books and you know welcome to mentoring people because or the coaching program because you have said i'll put my hand up teach me what you know um i I love it so putney got the boot right yes you've regrouped the austin's still kicking you're in sydney um you've saved and you've gone i'm going again and and, and you took those lessons and and just you know i guess broad strokes on your next one, two or three, you know, how did you go then from, I don't have a property, but I've had a good lesson to, Ooh, okay. I might be good at this. Yeah. Well, um, that period of time, um, I got involved in real estate as a real estate agent. So I started to learn different types of properties. Um, I had a early career in property management. I had, um, a career, in early residential sales. I got to spend time in different suburbs. I worked at a few different organizations. And then I just started to, like you say, seek out education around investing. Um, At the time, I also uh, looked at, um, you know, investing in businesses. So I started uh, actually a small business inside migration. Um, I did Prior to that, I did some travel overseas and got to understand what, you know, happens at a global level. And then really my next investments, um, I started to, one, understand more about market cycles because when I had bought as well, um, it probably arguably was the peak of the market um, and this was when I bought my first property. So it was a bit of a, a lesson was the peak of the market on a degrade asset. And, you know, really the future outlook for a property, which is a degrade asset at the peak of the market is is not good. And so really what I started to really link was, hang on a minute, though I'm enthusiastic, there is a, actually a, a world out there called economics. And my next investments i actually was more economically in tune with the way the world works that there is an economy there is actually fundamentals to seek out um and at the time it was in the early 2000s um then i started to invest heavily over inside of the perth market and the reason being was as a country we were going through some economic advantages through mining boom one and that's where i started to really get results from real estate my first uh deals over there that i bought i bought a couple um and that's where i started to almost what what i refer to as become a smorgasbord investor I did off the plan investing. I did a a subdivision. I did um, 
you know, a buy and hold. I did a build. I built um, a, a house over in Perth. So I was able to save money, put it into the market. I was able to recycle equity out of the Perth market. Um, it was very kind to me. The market um, soared in value over there during that period. Um, and this was a period of time where, you know, property values weren't that expensive. Um, so you're talking $150,000, $200,000 for a property. Um, so, you know, getting yourselves in a position to put some deposits down wasn't, it wasn't a massive amount at that peak. Did you spend time in Perth? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd always come and gone from Perth. So I, I knew that little bit of awareness because I think that that is such a, that's a huge leap in terms of understanding, confidence and all that as maybe not so much once you're in, inside our, say, our group positive. We know we're big picture thinking, five cities plan, all the rest. But as a young guy doing it on his own, um, I'm, I, I love hearing that, that you're like, yeah. you know what, it's not it's probably not going to be in Putney again. Um but it doesn't mean it's got to be in Sydney either. Where's the money? Yeah, and I, I had to go through a savings thing. And, and really, one of the next deals I did, I was looking – I don't know if you can remember the trading post. Yes. Um, I was a paper boy. I used to read it. Love yeah. Just in six, Dad. Oh, mate, I guess if anyone's um, seen the movie The Castle, you know, the, the son would always come in and go, you know, what do you think of this? Uh, you know, tell them they're dreaming. But um, I was reading the trading post one day and um, there was a place over in Perth where, and it, like I didn't have much money, so I needed to come up with ways to make money. So what I did at in my sort of rebound after my first property is – I had uh, several jobs. Um, I ran a market store on the weekend at um, Glebe Markets and at Roselle Market, and I sold stuff. Um, I worked at a real estate agent, and at night time I would do uh, telemarketing. And so I had three jobs. <laughs> And I was doing whatever I could to build up more deposits to go again to buy more real estate deals. And one deal that I sort of made about sixty, seventy thousand dollars on was came out of the trading post. And so what I did, I read the trading post and there was a government tender to remove four houses in an outback town in Western Australia. Uh, called Katanning and um, I decided to just tender for the job and I said <laughs> I'll pay you $5,000 to remove the houses and take them somewhere right and so the government put out this tender and four people bidded for it. The first one was going to cost the government 30000 I think the second one was going to cost the government 20000 The third one was like 19800 And then there was me. I was going to pay the government five grand to take these houses. And lo and behold, they sent me the contract and all of a sudden I'd won this tender to remove these houses in Katanning. I'd never even been to get at Katanning. I was <laughs> like, holy shit, what should I do here? And so instantly I basically then put an ad in the same paper, four houses for sale in Katanning not obviously the land component, the actual houses. And of course, some houses you can put on the back of a truck and, you know, take from one parcel of land to the other. And um, I had like 60 days to basically, sh you know, uh, almost like do the deal. Lo and behold, um, people rang up and it's like, yep, I'd love that house. Um yeah, I'll give you 15 grand for the house. And all of a sudden, I'd sold four houses without even owning them using just my wits 
about doing deals. And so one of the first deals I ever did after owning my first property was actually just hustling for more money. And after I did that deal and and basically um, optioned those houses and sold them, um, you know, I had a fair, fair bit of money at that time being quite young and uh, I was able to go and spread that around the Perth market. So I bought a couple of properties in Perth, bought one in uh, Kalgoorlie actually and um, yeah, the rest is history. I, I, I did uh, three strategies actually of those three properties. I did a uh, off the plan in Perth, which was very good. I put $15,000 down 18 months later, it was up about 180. Uh, I did a build, like a um, a new build, basically a house and land package, um, and that one had risen because of the market uh, quite handsomely by about a hundred. And I did a subdivision, a land subdivision um, in actually Kalgoorlie, uh, where I did a battle axe uh, subdivision. So I bought a property there. I think from memory it was only like. 115,000 and I added about a $85,000 in value by creating a second block of land on you know the the original block of land that I bought. Um, so between those three deals they created enough seed capital for me to go on and buy um, other real estate. At my peak of buy and hold, I got up to uh, 21 properties. Uh, I don't own 21 properties today, but the reason I don't is I sold some down to lower my debt level on uh, my other properties. So my LVR today is uh, is very, very low. Um, and that allows me to, to go into closer to that income off properties uh, goal, which I had, you know, understanding that I need to buy real estate for my 60 year old self not my uh, 25-year-old self. Where are we? And I'm going to say, you know, brain blown. Like, I love that. That is one of the best stories I've heard. <laughs> and the fact that it's come from the trading it's bit, post. It's a bit loose. The it old is trading post. outstanding. You know, and it's, um, it, it's, it's good, you know, um, there's a lot of- Opportunities are out there. But, you know, like, it, it makes me want to be like your mate and doing it with you. And let's go get in the Austin and go find these properties and the trading post and all of that sort of stuff. You, we, we love hustle. We love to know that people come from simple, humble beginnings, that it's self-made and that it wasn't, that's not easy and that's not straightforward. And that could have gone pear-shaped for you. You've signed a tender and you probably rung your dad. Hey, dad, what's a tender? Oh, Sam, you've been- <laughs> you, hey, once you sign there, bro, the the, the WA yeah, government yeah, got it was, you. So- it was it was definitely bizarre that um, I was I couldn't believe that the government doesn't check who is like who is this bloke Sam Saggers? Like, is sure. he even a builder? Is like- he what? He's, he's a guy. <laughs> no, he's a guy who bought the trading post. <laughs> so yeah, it was. Now, loose. There's a lesson in that, right? Because. We sometimes think that it's so organised and it's this this like archi- uh, you know architecturally you know wrong word you know it's it's this huge you know labyrinth of rules and lawyers and this and that and all the rest. But sometimes it's just a guy who picks up the phone. It literally oh, is and I'll confidence put- and yeah. a little bit of front and um, you know ha- having enough behind you to to, to get things going is what it takes. Oh, uh, look, definitely. I think there's opportunity everywhere, right? And, um, you know, just talking this morning, I mean, we found $75,000 in a deal because today some investors, uh, you know, some property owners are feeling the wobbles. They're feeling, oh, I'm a bit scared. I'm a bit nervous. But that creates someone else an opportunity, right? And never underestimate that a market is about human beings and uh, human beings do strange things. And uh, today, you know, we picked up for a client just in the deal-making section of the business, the ability to make $75,000 just buying a property because the vendor, the seller, 
has got the wobbles and wants to pass on $75,000. So it's out there. And I think, you know, opportunity is just a game of putting yourself in a position to, to see it. Um, and today, I guess a lot of people can't do that because to be fair to them, they've got other things on, they've got a, you know, a job at the science lab or they've got a job at, uh, you know, the hospital and, and it would be impossible to see the amount of opportunities that someone like myself who has dedicated my life to seeing opportunity sees. And I guess that that's why people also reach out to professionals in the industry, good property strategists like yourself to, to put them in touch with opportunities. Um, it's kind of how it, how it works. If you can't find it yourself, you've got to be, uh, you know, create a network and, and there's that old saying, right? Like your net worth is your network. And, uh, you know, if you don't, you don't have the network, you've got to go and sort that bit out. I love that distinction because we've heard from you in your early days. It was probably part in your DNA, certainly in your nurturing and how you grew up to have expansive thinking, to have, you know, the idea of where's the deal, I'm going to make it and hearing, you know, three jobs, the market stall, uh, working as an agent, you know, do on the phones at night. Um, you're always looking for opportunity. Um, I remember, you know, I have had that certainly in my life, but I'm probably more conservative and know my lane in that. So I studied accounting at university. So I don't think you did that. Um, I had some, you know, pretty, you know, pencil pushes around me and so forth. I love this group because I get to hear your stories and learn of them. I get to to get uplifted by that. Jace Whitten, many of us, and I think so many of the people that get attracted into positive go, you know what? I, I, I want that. I, I want to be part of that, but I know I just can't do it as me on my own, right? How, where does that exist? How does that happen? So stepping through that, um, you know, and, and, and surrounding yourself by good people is, um, is pivotal. Cause I was going to ask, do you think you learned that in life and to do that? We've heard your story. It was part in you. And then you did with your, your buddy and Franklin's and all of it. I just, you know what, I'm, I'm going to, I want to ask one or two more questions and then I'm going to, I, I'm putting you on the spot here, but I'm, I've seen the time. We've probably been on for 40, 45 minutes. I think I told you we'd be 20 minutes, Sam. And I I, I, I yeah, got you on this call. It's short and sharp need a podcast. Favor, I want to interview. <laughs> I'm going to do this All to good. people. If we sort of, we've got one or two more questions, but this is a, a huge episode. And I would say it's part one of an installment in Sam's, you know, journey. And this, this you know, from, from Putney to Katanning, Right and and you know five houses off the back of a truck that sold through the the, the post <laughs> to make your money to Bring build back a the trade in twenty one. We went from Katanning to twenty one properties pretty quick. So I don't want to miss the opportunity to hear that. And I know everyone tuning in will love to hear that. I reckon we save that for another day. And so Sounds stay good. tuned. Yep, stay tuned on that front. Um, but let's sort of wrap it here today. Um, outstanding lessons. Um. You saw, you know, just opportunity. I love hearing that, that there's always opportunity in there. Um, maybe to this point um, in your story, if you could go back and redo stuff, mate, that's always a good question on a podcast, isn't it? What would you do different if you, you know, you're, you're back, you're standing at the front of the auction or talking to the agent and Putney and he's going, let's go, Sam, just sign here. Um, what would you do different? Um, I guess, you know, Enthusiasm's one thing, but also just understanding that real estate um, is something that is going to, if done right, look after you later in life. Probably my lesson early would be to really uh, get some education from the right people who understand real estate. If I had learnt a little bit early on about you know, buying in a better suburb creates better growth and, um, you know, better locations equals better return on investment and, you know, better um, assets ultimately stand out from the crowd. I probably would have, you know, changed what I'd bought. Um, certainly through my uh, investment journey, um, some of the things I bought 
I probably would have bought something down the street around the corner. Um, so there are a lot of lessons, I think, you know, as it stands out, if I was talking to my younger self, I'd probably just, you know, give myself reassurance that the real estate market, the fears, the worries, they all pass. Um, some things, you know, you know, you spend so much energy fretting about them and they never even eventuate. I mean, today we we learned that land tax reforms aren't going to happen in Queensland. I mean, the amount of energy and, uh, you know, mental conversations people have had about that, it passes. And, and I think, you know, what I've just learned over the years as, you know, as much as this stuff, you know, becomes headline news, it all passes. And, and I think you just learn that from time in the chair, right? Time, um, you know, doing this thing that, you know, just get on with it. Um, learn to just, yeah, just accept that as much as real estate goes in the right direction or the economy goes in the right direction, it also goes in the other direction. And you've just got to deal with that as a human being. So, I don't know if I answered that question well, but, you know, I, I, I think, you know, we all sometimes just overthink this thing. It's, 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 it's a pretty simple thing, real estate. You buy it, you make sure it's half decent and you hold it. And uh, if you do that well, you won't experience what I experienced, which was a diminishing marginal return on the investment. In other words, you probably don't want to own real estate, which over time kills your actual income from the real estate. And there's a lot of real estate out there, which people won't end up financially free from because the day they go to retire, um, they, they won't have a return because they'll need to reinvest it into the asset to create a return. And it'll be too expensive for them to do. And, and I do worry about, you know, certain assets out in the marketplace that people hold, which are just not aligned with where they're headed. And probably my lesson, and I'll, I have said it, but I think the parting lesson is don't buy for the 20 year old you or the 30 year old you or the 40 year old you or the 50 year old you buy the real estate for the 65 year old you that no longer has a job. And uh, the more you think about your future self, the kinder your future self is going to, the kinder position you're going to put your future self in, if that kind of makes sense. So it makes so much sense. And it's a, it's a wonderful um, le lesson you've shared and you've shared it through story. I'm very grateful for that. And you've really given us um, so much, uh, you know, I, I've, I've loved every word of this. Um, I love the lesson. And that's what we're here for. We're here to share stories, to share to, to share lessons so that we can, you know, maybe not go through as much pain as others or get to the, the end result quick or whatever it is. But I love hearing that. Buy the property that you want your 65-year-old self to have. I love it. That's It's a new distinction for me. Awesome, and, mate. And I'm sure I'm, I, I've got no doubt, I speak to everyone tuning in and listening, that they would say exactly the same. So from Putney to Katanning, this is this is uh, this is part one. I absolutely love it. I've heard some great things, man, and I I'm not going to hold you to it. But I'd love to think that we could uh, get back on here one day and hear from uh, you know from from phase two as you build a 21 property portfolio that has since reduced into a blue chip um, holdings that's going to provide the 65 year old Sam with the life he wants. And exactly. you know, that's, that's it, mate. Beautiful, very, very beautiful summary. Beautiful summary. Well, thanks for your time, James. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Sam Saggers, for being part of Property Investor Tales, stories from the front yard. Thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in today. We will say over and out for now until the next episode. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Property Investor Tales. Remember to subscribe so you get notified every time a new episode drops. As you can guess, we love hearing people's property investor tales. So if you'd like to share yours, then please get in touch with us via email at positiveinvestortales at positivementor.com. 
www.thepodcastnetwork.com.au. We also love your feedback and would appreciate a five-star review over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Remember, you can watch all of these podcasts over on YouTube at Positive Mentor or at positivementor.com.au. Until then, take care and bye for now.